Okay, so um, I've wanted to do this for a very long time. Um, if you know much about modern church history, there's a lot of division among Christians about whether or not women uh, should be able to be in ministry or not. And this is actually a huge issue for a lot of people. I think it's kind of a stupid issue, but I, I, it's not good practice as a leader to just simply ignore a problem and hope that it goes away. I mean, this has been a problem that has existed for years and years and years that, you know, people are arguing back and forth. And uh, so I don't think that ignoring it is going to make it go away. And I really think that the church is being um, impoverished by not ha allowing women um, to enrich it. And uh, I am going to show through the Bible itself, not through my own opinion, through the Bible itself, that women have a very important role, and it does not consist of staying at home cooking for the man. Okay, so let's let's look at this. Okay, putting women in their place. I thought that was funny. Yeah? <laughs> um, first off, let's look at what the Bible describes as the woman. You know, what is her role? What is she, what is she like? Because a lot of things that we believe today really don't fit too well. Okay. First off, in Genesis 127, it says that woman was made in the image of God. This is a very important point because just like man was made in the image of God, woman was made in the image of God. They both share that unique character. It's not man is more special than woman. They were both made in the image of God. That's a very important because it, it says it twice. They were made in the image of God. Man and female, he made them in the image of God. So Genesis 2.18 says that woman was created to be a help to the man. Now, some people have said that because it says help, that just means that they were, a woman was created for the, for the man. Just basically she has to revolve her world around him. But that's not the idea of the word, of the word help. It, it doesn't mean to be subordinate to. Help is even used of God helping people. And God will be your help, you know, all throughout Scripture. Uh, it's it, The idea of subordination is not part of this word. That's something that we add because we have a whole, a whole long history of sexism in the church. And so obviously, you know, that just kind of transfers over. The more obvious <laughs> meaning of the word help, especially if you look at it as it applies, uh, as it's used throughout the Bible, is to work towards a common goal, okay? Think of it as like a t the tires on a car help the engine, right? Because if the engine's just sitting there revving with no tires, obviously we're not going to go anywhere. Think of it kind of like that. Um, in Genesis 2.24, it says that, well, I'm, just, I'm actually going to read this one. Um, I'm trying not to do a whole lot of reading because I have a lot of um, references here and I don't want to, you know, uh, have this be an hour and a half long video. Genesis 2.24 says, um, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife. Now, in that time, it was very common for the wife to have to leave the husband, but not so much for men to have to leave their wives. So it says, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother. Just like the, you're expecting the wife to, the husband has to, too. Okay, well, let's keep going here and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So they have equal voice and decisions. They are one. See, what what a lot of Christians try to do is they try and, and modify this. Okay, we've been made one, but that's only talking about sex. It's actually more like this. You know, I'm, I'm the head of the household. Okay, all right, so that how is that being made one? So let's, let's keep going. So then we get to Genesis 3.16, and it gives us an explanation as to, okay, if man and woman were both made in the image of God, why do we not see that equality? Why do we see men continually throughout history being over-domineering uh, on the woman? And in fact, this is something that kind of grosses me out because the church, instead of setting a tone for, for, for beauty and for equality and for you know growth and, and, and togetherness and unity, it has followed suit with our with the culture and said okay because the culture um, uh, subjects women now we should follow that in the church and then the worst part about it is that new testament scripture is taken out of context to support 
the idea that women were pretty much have to revolve their entire world around men, even to the point that many even believe that even if a woman is not is not married to a man, she still has to be submitted in everything. So let, let's we'll look at this, but stick with me, okay? So 3.16 kind of answers the question as to why are women so mistreated? Because of the presence of sin in our lives, it says, he will rule over you. And what will prevent a woman from just saying, you know, enough is enough? Because she will be, it says in 16, her desire will be for the husband. In other words, a, women, by and large, will be drawn to the idea of a relationship they will be drawn to that intimacy. And so even though they will, they will be, you know, stepped on and mistreated throughout the years, there's still going to be something in them that just desires to have a solid relationship. So then that takes us to Proverbs 31.6, talking about the role of the women. Now, before we get ahead of ourselves, it should be noticed that, noticed that Proverbs 1 through 30 talked about how a woman, I mean, how the man should be a man of character. So then... In 31, when we see, okay, this is what the perfect woman should look like. Yeah, and this, the rest of the entire book is how the perfect man should look like. So maybe, excuse me, maybe refrain from expecting your wife to measure up perfectly with Proverbs 31. It's just, it's a, it's a proverb. Let, I'll leave it there. But anyways, um, if you look at Proverbs 31, some of the things that are in there are actually things that um, seem to imply female Equality. First off, in, in chapter in verse 16, it clearly says that the woman is allowed to work outside of the home. You know, a lot of times religious people have this idea that women can't work. Well, that's not true. See, just because working is the curse that God gave to man because he sinned. If woman wants to join in the curse of working, that's fine. There's nothing restricting it. But man was specifically given the curse. Okay, once again, so in the case of single women, yes, they can still work. There's an, <laughs> it's missing the point. See, work is now – our lives oftentimes kind of revolve around our jobs, and it's not wasn't supposed to be like that. And so when we look for happiness in, in work, it's just not going to happen. We weren't created to work. Work is – the result of us being under the curse. Now we have to work to get money to pay rent and those kinds of things. That's not how Eden, the Garden of Eden, was supposed to work. Um, so um, women are totally allowed to work biblically. Um, and more importantly is, is this point here. What defines a woman's beauty is not her looks. Okay, If you're over the age of 30, you, you pretty much know looks are very, very, very quick to fade. I mean, when you're a kid, you know, you're a kid, and then you become a teenager, and you start having, like, zits and all kinds of problems, and then finally you start exiting your teen years, and you have the the, the perfect, you know, the, your perfect self is about 20, and then it's all downhill from there. You start getting wrinkles, uh, you start getting gray hairs, you start losing hair, you start getting a belly, you know, it's a constant fight. You have to start constantly eating healthy and working out because your body just kind of starts falling apart after 20. You know, and then you get to 30 and you start seeing that you have um, gray hairs and wrinkles and you're like, oh my God, I'm going to die. You know, <laughs> and uh, that's just kind of the way it goes. But but for women, beauty in the Bible is never about looks. It's about character. See, truly being beautiful, truly being, being someone who is just, wow, she is gorgeous, it has to do with character. See, God made you special. And... In his eyes, you have worth. Your worth is not based off of the things that you can do in this world. Your worth is based off the fact that you are made in the image of God. You have worth in and of yourself. Nothing that a woman can do will ever make her more or less loved by God, uh, worthy as a person. Okay. Now, Nothing that you do will make you more I – mean, nothing that you put on or wear will make you more beautiful than your character. Be a person of character, and that makes you beautiful. Don't worry about your, your looks fading. That's not the thing that makes you you. If all we are is, is our appearance, well, then for people who've been burned or been um, gotten in a car accident or stuff, that pretty much means that they don't have worth. 
See what I mean? Our worth cannot be in any way connected with our looks. Um, also, if you'll notice, nowhere in here did it say anything about women having to have um, wear dresses and knit and sew. Didn't say anything like that. Um, and besides 1 Corinthians, which is very much so talking about a specific situation, women weren't even commanded to have certain haircuts, okay? Once again, I'm not going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter like 9 or wherever it is where it's talking about uh, women having hair, I'm, I'm, we're not gonna talk, or head coverings, I'm not going to talk about that. So, um, in Ephesians 5.25, it clearly says, you know, okay, so wives, respect your husbands. Okay, we'll talk about that in just a minute. But then it says that a husband is to love his wife. That means that he is to put her first. He must always revolve the marriage around her. He, she deserves the love of the husband. It's not something that a husband should make her have to feel like she earns. It should be something that the husband just affirms her. That's loving people. That's loving your wife. So let's look at some women leaders in history. Okay. I was under the impression that women have always been um, had the role that they have, and you know you shouldn't you don't rock the boat. But if you actually look at history, that's not the case. Ahusa Gonzalez, who is, I mean, kind of like the church historian. Um, if you don't know him, I you probably don't know a whole lot about church history. Uh, <laughs> he's kind of like the go-to guy. He's kind of a big deal. Uh, he makes the point in his. Uh, story of Christianity series, that women in the earliest times in the church actually had uh, roles. And what changed was as the church grew and heresy started spreading and, it, and the church became more and more uh, imperialized, women uh, lost their place more and more throughout time, even to the point where we get into the medieval ages and stuff, and, and it was not good. <laughs> really not, not, not good. Uh, <laughs> but if you look back in early church history, um, that was not the case for the for the beginning of the early church. Um, it it was one of the first uh, things to go with good theology um, as the church became bigger. Um, and Craig Blomberg, who's a well known uh, uh, professor uh, in Denver, uh, makes the point in his. I think it's from Pentecost to Patmos, but I'm not sure which one of his one of his works. Um, Anyways, he makes the comment that the only role that we don't have a, a biblical example of a woman holding is the lead pastor. That's kind of significant. Um, and I don't want to blush on that too much, but keep that in mind, okay? So, as far as restrictions on women leaders, there really are none. It never says women cannot be leaders. Uh, people have assumed, but... That's, once again, looking back while carrying all this garbage. Um, no, matter, no matter how good the translator, no matter how good the historian, everybody is subject to some level of bias in their studies. Um, and we're not trying to find out what we believe and validate it. We're trying to find out what the original picture looked like. So we have to wade, wade through 2,000 years of church history. Um, to, to, to arrive at some kind of uh, original model. So uh, let's keep going. I know some of you are probably at this point saying, now hold on, there are biblical restrictions. Let me get let me get there. Don't don't rush ahead. Um, in Exodus 38.8, it mentions that women served at the tabernacle. Um, so they had some kind of a role. Um, in Leviticus 12, uh, you know, and, and let me just back up about the law. Female priests were not unknown. In the ancient world and with that in mind the Bible nowhere in the law amidst all those laws nowhere did it say that a woman could not be a priest so let's let's remember that Leviticus 12 gives restrictions on uh, women after childbirth there's a few things about this first off it's not because the woman sinned or, or anything like that it's because blood was sacred and that made her ceremonially unclean it doesn't mean that she sinned it means that in order to be ritually pure, she had to go through the things, and that has to do with the law. That's a whole different thing. But some people would say, well, girls, um, baby girls had were unclean longer than baby boys. Well, the reason for that is because baby girls couldn't be circumcised. 
they didn't have a penis to circumcise, and that was the um, the 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 big sign of the of the covenant was being circumcised. It was such a big deal that Paul was still having issues with it after Jesus came, and the law was set aside. So I mean, wow. Uh, so with that being said, uh, since girls couldn't be circumcised, they had to they were they were ritually impure for twice as long as boys. Um, once again, it has nothing to do with with women being less. Okay, uh, in Judges four through five, uh, a a woman was the judge and leader of Israel. Her name was Deborah. So I, I think that that's kind of important. Um, so we we're seeing examples all throughout the Bible in the Gospel. Uh, women were foundational to the gospel being spread. Uh, the people who first found out about Jesus' resurrection were women. Well, besides the Roman guards that fell back and were blinded, besides them. Uh, the women were the ones who went to the disciples and said, Hey, without the women, see what I mean? Like In the gospels, there's this big focus on, on the role that women played. And... Uh, just because in that culture women were uh, very much so limited doesn't mean that we should say, okay, so women should never have a role in ministry because the culture didn't allow for it. So let's let's keep going, okay? In Acts 2:17 through 18 and 21, 9, it mentions about how women can prophesy, and that's kind of important. In Acts 18:26, it says that Priscilla and her husband Aquila uh, went and corrected someone, and the way that Greek works, uh, it would Priscilla first, which means that she was the one who actually took the lead, and her husband just kind of went with her. Um, and that seems to be kind of the, the emphasis there, is that Priscilla was the one uh, who was taking up the lead. Um, it's probably good that she took her husband so it didn't look bad, you know. Um, obviously, you can kind of fill in the blanks there. Uh, but then in Romans 16, 1 through 2, we see a woman deacon. Um, and it actually uses the word deacon. I know some translations translate it as a servant, but no, it is actually uh, deacon. Uh, Romans 16, 7, it, there's a female uh, apostle, Junia. Um, in Galatians 3, 28, it clearly says, clearly, clearly, clearly says that uh, there's no longer male or female. Obviously, it's not talking about, you know, there is no longer a role. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we can't all have you know, both sex organs. He's obviously not talking about that. But he's talking about the restoration that happens. It, the salvation and the church was supposed to be a restoration of what we were truly meant to be. And in that restoration, there shouldn't be that man and woman butting heads. There shouldn't be that, you know, feelings of superiority and ethnic purity. And all. There shouldn't be those things. There should be restoration. That's why he says there's no longer Jew or Gentile. There's no longer slave or free. Slave or free. You know, we're looking at in the body, everybody has uh, worth, you know, has that renewed glory. Um, and, and, and that's really the main focus. Now, I, I have included in the link below this video um, a link to the Assemblies of God uh position paper on women in ministry. I highly encourage you to read that. And also um, a link to a book um, of talking about uh, the historical context of a lot of the uh, um, women passages in the New Testament. Um, I highly encourage you to look at that. So what does it mean in Ephesians 5 when it says that a woman has to be subject to her husband? I mentioned this a little while ago, but I really want to highlight this. Well, from all the evidence that we've looked at through the Bible, we know it doesn't mean that he can make all the decisions. He just kind of says how things go, and she just has to go along with it. That's not what it means, because that would mean, you see, I mean, when it, when it says, husbands love your wives like Christ did, Christ gave himself up for the woman, I mean, for the church. In the same way, husband is to give himself up. How can you say that you're giving yourself up for the wife when you are acting like a tyrant over her? Proverbs, we saw that a woman can, in fact, go out into the world and, and, and have a business or work and those kinds of things. But the main focus here is that men and women, uh, husbands and wife, should, should see eye to eye. They should get on the same page. And it's really hard to do that when a husband puts himself over her continually. Well, I'm the husband of the I'm the I'm the husband. I, I the, the 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 buck stops here. You know, I make the final decisions. That's not really showing love. <laughs> 
I mean, if you compare that with what we see in First First Corinthians chapter 12, you know, I think it's pretty obvious that a man should not be doing that. A man shouldn't say, well, I am the head, I make the check, so I get to spend it however I want. And likewise, a wife shouldn't go spending the money either. I mean, we're, we're talking about the renewal of, um, you know, something something great through Christianity. We're not talking about resorting back to the same fights that we've been enslaved to for thousands and thousands of years. Um, it also doesn't mean that she is less or inferior, okay? What it means is to respect him. Respect your husband, okay? Work with him and not against him. If you, you, you who are married know it is very easy wives to um, to get kind of honorary towards your husband just kind of you know try to spite him you know what I mean uh, maybe he hurt your feelings maybe he didn't consider you when he was doing something or whatever and you just kind of get your feelings hurt and so you just kind of start getting a stiff neck towards him and you know maybe saying snide things maybe uh, you know not doing things for him you know it, but being subject to your husband doesn't mean that you do all the laundry, you do the dishes, you clean the house, you 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 do all the chores. That's not what it means. Okay, if a husband and wife truly are one, that means they both got the clothes dirty. They should both be responsible for cleaning the clothes. Who lives in the house? Both of them. So both of them should <laughs> should clean the house. Who is the parent? Both of them. So both of them should should raise the children up together. You see, a lot of this whole wife being subject to husband, we instantly get offended. Oh, I'm not going to be subject when we don't actually realize what's being said. See, once again, when something is said, you, you have to look past 2,000 years of history of it being misapplied and go back to the source. Okay, so a woman, yes, a woman is required to, to be subject to her husband. What, what that means is respect him. Okay, think highly of him. Okay, don't don't sit there and sigh under your breath and and, and and think about how he's just an idiot and that's not respecting him. Respect him. Uh, work with him and not against him. If you are not working with your spouse, you are actively tearing down your house. You're working towards a divorce and you are teaching your kids not to respect them either. A marriage is abs it's absolutely essential that a marriage. I mean, you, you who are married know that both people are working towards the common goal. Um, and to talk well of him. Don't go to your girlfriends behind his back and criticize him. That's not being subjected to your husband. So when you look at it in that, being subject to your husband really isn't that big of a deal. We're not talking about give up your rights, give up your personhood, you know, have no say in the marriage, uh, do everything that he says and just kind of bow down to him. That's not what it's about. And also it needs to be said that men are not allowed, husbands are not allowed to demand sex from their wives. Um, the passage in 1 Corinthians says, you know, don't withhold yourself from your partner. If, you're, if your wife doesn't want to have sex with you, there's probably a reason why. And that's probably a, a sign that something... Something is not well in the marriage that needs to be addressed. So, uh, and it also says the same thing the other way around. Husbands, you can't hold yourself back from your wife. So obviously, that doesn't mean that every single time that your spouse wants to have sex, you have to right then. Um, it's probably a good idea, but, you know, there's a lot of things that can happen, and we need to be understanding of our spouses. Um, maybe tonight we could not have sex, and then tomorrow we could. See what I mean? Um... So let's look at some specific passages that have been misapplied to basically say that women can't um, can't be in ministry. The first one that I want to want us to talk about is 1 Corinthians chapter 14, uh, towards the end of the chapter or end of the um, well, the end of the chapter, but the end of the book too. Uh, he's talking um, about different things about keeping order in the church, and one of the last things he addresses is in verse 34: the women are to keep silent in the churches. For they are not permitted to speak, but are to subject themselves just as the law also says. Now, it's important to note that he's not talking about the law, the Moses law, because there was no law in there about women being silent. So <laughs> um, he's more talking about tradition. Um, in verse 35, if they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home. For it is improper for women to speak in church. So that part right there should be the part that clues us into the fact that this is He's, he's talking about a specific context, specific problem. Okay, what we try and do is we read through the New Testament without 
understanding the biggest point about the New Testament. Most of the New Testament is consists of letters. Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians. These were letters written to specific congregations to address specific issues. So if we don't even look for the issues to what this is talking about, we're not going to understand it. Okay, you can you can make the Bible say anything if you ignore the context. First off, he's not saying that women have to be completely silent. We know that because in chapter 11, verse 5, he talks about women prophesying and praying. So if they were prophesying and praying, it'd be very hard to prophesy without talking. So we know right there he's not talking about complete silence. That should be the first clue. Okay. Um, evidently, the women were causing some sort of a distraction. The women are to keep silent in the churches, but they are not permitted to speak, but are to subject themselves. Okay, if they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is improper for women, women to speak out in church. Um, it, once again, it looks very much so like he's talking about something contextual. Um, he's talking about, if you look through the chapter in 14, he's talking about a, a long series of little footnotes. Okay? Um, when you assemble, each one has, a, each one has a, po a psalm, a teaching, a revelation. If anyone speaks in a tongue, it should be by two or at most three, and one must interpret. He's talking about these different things. Uh, two or three prophets speak. Okay, la da 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 da. He's going through these different things, and, he, and that's like one of those footnotes. So what we've done is we've expanded this minor footnote that is driven by a context and said, okay, now we have a major doctrine. Women should not speak in church. What? What? <laughs> You know, we, we've we've taken something and we've just expanded it past its meaning. I mean, let's let's take that let's take that about everything. If okay, so if we can take a minor event and expand it past its obvious context, that would mean that anybody any time that a Christian lies about their finances, they should be killed. Because remember, uh, Ananias and Sapphira were, were both killed by the Holy Spirit, but still killed uh, for lying. Um, which that's a whole other thing, um, lying to God, and, and it's just a whole different thing. But you see, I mean, if, if we say that every single time that something occurs in the Bible, that means it should happen, and that it's the one for all. With that, when we just ignore the context, I mean, you could literally say that the Bible condones anything. It condones slavery, if that's the case. Um, it condones uh, sleeping around and having multiple spouses. It can. It, it, see what I mean? Like you, you, you can't just remove the context. Um, the New Testament is not a new Old Testament law, and a lot of times people go to the New Testament looking for it to give a list of do's and don'ts because that's what the law does. But it's important to remember that Paul is usually applying scriptures to a specific situation and not writing a new law. He wasn't trying to take the place of the law because we are no longer free from the law. From the law, why would he want to go back to it? Um, obviously, if you look at the context, he's talking about prophecy, so it seems very likely that, that um, there's a distraction be, being caused from women evaluating prophecy. Uh, either way, it seems like he's trying to bring order. Um, it, in fact, if you hop down to verse 40, it says, all things must be done properly and in an orderly manner. Um, and it says somewhere in the chapter, um, I forget exactly where, but it talks about God is not a God of chaos. Oh, right here in verse 33. For verse 33, for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. God God is not a God of chaos. Now, if you've ever been in a church that uses gifts like prophecy, you know how very easily it is for people to kind of get a little bit, you know, lost. A little bit into the weird, a little bit unrestrained. If you've ever been in a church where everybody's just talking in tongues, you know, just the complete chaos. It's like, uh, what's going on? And that seems to be what's going on here. Um, there's some women or wives, and it's unclear how it should be translated, um, and they're causing a little bit of a distraction here. Um, and so it it seems to imply also that he's talking about women because it says, ask their husbands at home. Um, so obviously probably wives. So these wives, instead of causing the problem that they are causing, um, should instead... Uh, go home and, and, and talk about it with their husbands, and then the husbands can worry about it there. Um, and it seems like um, very much so talking about that specific circumstance. Okay. Especially since, once again, it can't be, it is improper for women to speak in church, because he already said that women could speak in church. So, um, so 
just in case I haven't been clear about this, either he's saying that, you know, maybe it was, for instance, a house church where the women were cooking or something, uh, in which case, hey, let's be quiet so that we can focus on this, or um, they were um, uh, partaking of um, correcting uh, words that were given, maybe a prophecy was given and they were just kind of maybe analyzing it vocally instead of letting the leaders do it, in which case you'd be saying, hey, you know, you need to, you need to stop and you're interrupting the flow of the service. Um, and once again, if you've ever been in a little bit less legalistic church where things can sometimes get out of hand and just kind of chaotic, you kind of understand what's being said here. So, anyways, uh, another one is in 2 Timothy chapter 2. I'm sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 2. And it, it's talking about different things. And then in, in verse 9, it talks about, um, oops, wrong book. In verse 9, it talks about how um, women are to adorn themselves. Okay, all right, not trying to turn heads and all that stuff. But then in verse 11, he says, a woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. But I do, not, I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over man, but to remain quiet. For it was Adam who was first created, and then Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. But women will be preserved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. So first off, it's important to know that this has nothing to do with in the church. Paul is talking about generally, okay? Now, in verse 8, he talks about men, and it says, Therefore, I want the men in every place to pray, okay? Lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. Be at peace. Don't be causing problems. Then he goes to 9. I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing. He doesn't say in church. He says, I want women to dress modestly. You know, don't... He never says in church. But somewhere along the line, we said, okay, he's talking about church structure here. And then we've started saying about how he's talking about how women can't be pastors. He hasn't even started talking about pastors yet. That's in chapter 3. There's no reason to assume that he's talking about that here. So let's let's keep going here. Um, verse 11, I want a woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. This is how people were learned, were learned, how people learned uh, when they were being taught. It was, you, you, you submitted yourself to the teacher, you were quiet, okay, don't remove it from its con context. So basically what he's saying is, let the women learn, but respectfully, okay? Now we know that he's not saying anti um, about quietness always being quiet, because in chapter 2, verse 2, he says, For kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Obviously he's not talking about not talking, <laughs> it's the same word there about tranquil and quiet life that's applied here to the wife, to the woman. Um, a woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. Do it respectfully is what he's saying. The word doesn't mean quiet as in not talking. It means quiet as in respectful. Okay? So then um, it's also important to note that he switches in the Greek form here. In verse 9 he says, I want women to adorn themselves, right? But then in verse 11 it switches to a woman, which seems to imply that he's saying a wife. A wife must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. Now, also important is to note that Paul is clearly saying address the issue. These women were not, um, were not, uh, they were kind of believing in, 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 in heresy, in false teachings. And so what, he, what his solution there is don't prevent them from teaching, let them learn. And that's very important because in a male-dominated society, for Paul to specifically say, I, a, a, a woman or wife must must quietly learn. She must learn. Okay, so the, the, very important. Um, in but then we also see that there's what's called a chiasm. Okay, the first point relates to the last point. The next point relates to that point, and then whatever is the middle point is the main highlight. In this case, the end of verse 12 is the main point of verses 11 through 14, and that point is. Remain quiet. And what that means is respectful. Remain respectful. Okay? Basically, don't be causing problems. Don't be just... Uh, sometimes when husbands and wives specifically are discussing things, sometimes a, you know, a wife can kind of get her feelings hurt and just kind of um, butt against the, against the husband. So obviously what he's saying here is, you know, hey... 
let's 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 kind of get along now. <laughs> so in verse 11, receive receive instruction, and why why should a woman receive instruction? Because of verse 14, it was not Adam who was deceived; he he sinned on purpose. Adam 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 knew what he was doing. He sinned on purpose and didn't warn the warn Eve, and he sinned on purpose. That's very important. But Eve, she was deceived. And because she was deceived, then she fell into transgression and all the bad things that came with that. So what's Paul's solution to this? The wives should be learning because it was because Eve was not, was not taught by Adam that she sinned. So a husband clearly must take his responsibility with his wife um, uh, more seriously. You know, uh, you should be teaching your wife. Don't just don't just leave her out there. She should be learning. Now, it's that's not a big deal now because we live in a Western world and women have a lot more freedom. But back then, this was groundbreaking. Paul's statement was just groundbreaking. So then, in verse twelve, I do not allow uh, the wife to teach or exercise authority over over uh, the husband. Why? For for it was Adam who was first created, and then Eve. See, because Adam was created first. The wife shouldn't be shouldn't be taking dominance in this, and because um, because Eve was deceived, she should be taught, or the wife should be taught. I don't have time to get into all the different aspects of this, but once again, if you follow the two links that I've included below this video, you'll really be able to um, have a much more uh, in-depth understanding of this. Um, so okay, let the wife receive instruction. Um, I don't want the wife the wife to be um, teaching or having authority over the, over the husband, um, but let the wife remain respectful. So what that seems to imply to me is that husbands were not addressing the false teachings with their wives, okay? And then, uh, so husbands were not addressing the problem with their wife, the, what the false teachings that their wife, wives were believing, and then um, wives were being uh, combative to the husband, and so okay. Um, I do not allow the wife to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. Let her let wives. You, you do need to learn, and husbands, you do need to you do need you do need to let them learn. So that takes us to verse 15, where it says, "But women will be preserved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint." Now, in the Greek, it actually says, "She will be preserved through the bearing of children if they." Continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. It switches from the singular, she, to the plural, they. She will be preserved through childbirth, if. So there's a few different ways of looking up at this. The most obviously incorrect is she will be saved. In other words, her salvation is dependent on her uh, staying at home and being a bread uh, not a breadwinner, but, uh, uh, you know, taking care of the house and that kind of stuff. Okay? Um, but that's obviously not what it's saying. So we were talking about how Eve, but but the, the wife was deceived and fell into transgression, but she will be preserved through childbirth. Now this could mean a second thing. Okay, Eve will be restored by the birth of Jesus if women continue in, but that also doesn't really make sense. So that leads us to the most likely, um, but she, the wife, will be preserved through childbirth because we, there's two things that we know. First off, if Ephesus, which is where Timothy is when he was receiving this letter, there was a, a very big um, deity cult, uh, Artemis, great as Artemis of the Ephesians. And um, uh, Artemis was uh, for, I don't, I'm a little bit brain fart here, um, pregnant women uh, would, would pray to Artemis. Uh, what's that called? Um, you know what I'm saying. Anyways, the god Artemis was for um, fer fertility and pregnancy and those kinds of things. So women in Ephesus would pray to Artemis. Um, because once again, childbirth was a lot scarier back then. I mean, it wasn't that uncommon for women to die in childbirth. And what Paul is here is saying is, um, first off, he's hinting that they shouldn't be praying to Artemis. But then also there's a, there's a heresy going on in the church, which you can read about in First Timothy, where marriage was considered not a good thing. So in a, so what he's saying here is women will be preserved in the faith through the childbirth. They're, they're not going to lose their salvation by having kids. And secondly, um, God will uh, 
God will protect them in, in, through, through childbirth um, if if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. Self um, so obviously those things are the things of salvation. Faith, that's the root of salvation. Love is the sign of salvation. Uh, sanctity, you can't call yourself a Christian if you're not living like a, like a Christian. And self-restraint, that goes right along hand in hand with sanctity. So um, so how, how should we see this thing all together? The women... Who are who are being mis the wives who are being misled should be taught by their husbands, and while they are being taught, they should be respectful. The, let's resolve this issue and let's not let um, husbands and wife fight about this stupid thing. Let's just get this thing this issue resolved, okay? And you know, Adam was created first, so it is it is the husband's responsibility to fix that imbalance in the house. It it, it is his responsibility. He needs to step up his game and and take care of this. Um, and then um, because uh, Eve was misled, teaching her, teaching the, the wife will, will prevent her from being misled. And then as that specifically applies to how they were being misled about, uh, about marriage and um, about Artemis, um, if she, the wife, um, or she, the wife, will be preserved um, in her salvation uh, through the bearing of children, She'll be preserved through that. If, if, the, it's all contingent on this, if women continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. So what Paul is doing is he's applying how wives need to, need to learn, if she, but then applies it, now here's a message for all women. If they continue in faith, women should continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. Now this isn't saying anything against men, that men shouldn't do this also, but there's a specific issue that Paul's addressing, which brings me to the last point. It's clearly context-driven. So then, now that he's talked about this issue in the household, now he goes to chapter 3 where he's talking about uh, church structure. And it says, in the NASB it says, it is a trustworthy statement if any man aspires to the office. But that's not the way the Greek says. The Greek says, if anyone aspires to the office of overseer. Now, some people say, yes, but anyone is a masculine word in the Greek. Yes, because that's how he would have written. Just like he says, now brothers. Well, obviously he means brothers and sisters, people of the body. But that's not how you wrote back then. You would just say one umbrella term. Now brothers, which includes everyone in the body. The same way anyone includes everyone in the body. So if anyone wants to be an overseer, it's a good thing. So that actually seems to be implying that women can be overseers, and an overseer is a pastor. So in other words, the very same passage that is most used for keeping women out of ministry actually seems to be encouraging women to not only be in ministry, but to not be afraid of childbirth, and to continue being married, and for there to be a good, healthy marriage all in the same all in the same bed. So with that, I, I finish my... my my appeal here with this. The church cannot continue like this. We need the unique skills of women. We need the unique opinions of women. And we need the unique skill set of women. This whole thing about women being pushed aside in ministry is excluding 50% of the body of Christ. Not only that, but let's think more practically here for just a second. The majority of Christian people go who or go to churches, women outnumber men. So statistically, we need more women in ministry because statistically there aren't enough men to go around. See, we need to start having serious conversations about ministry and about roles. And we need to be serious about looking past our own church's tradition, past our doctrine, past all those things, and going to the source and actually looking at these things. Now, I've made an appeal that women need to be um, in ministry from the Bible. I've made an appeal that they need to be in leadership from the Bible. I've made an appeal that because of history, because of context, because of just common sense, because of uh, statistics. I hope that somewhere in there is enough evidence to somehow convince you that what Galatians 3.28 says is true, that there is no longer slave or free, Jew or Gentile, man or woman, especially in context that there's no longer Jew or Gentile. 
then how should we keep the stupid con the stupid divorce of the body of Christ and say, no, no, there are now two bodies of Christ. There's the men, the elite group, and then there's the women, the less elite group. I know that, but why does that even make sense in any practical application? That women would be allowed to be deacons, uh, prophets, apostles, but not senior pastors. How does that even remotely make sense? That it, it doesn't. But for whatever reason, people can't look past their own traditions that came after the early church was already established. So please, please, please consider what I've said, and don't just shoot it down instantly because it's not the view that you're...